Good morning. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist uh, Church this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're um, listening online. It's good to be together. I wanted to um, point out to you the things in the bulletin this morning. Please notice the announcements and the invitations there because you are invited. The Lenten uh, Bible study um, led by Drew Harvey is focused on the Gospel of Luke this year, and there are two different times to, um, to be a part of that. Um, it starts February 21st. It's the first day to reserve um, daffodils or tulips in support of our Trinity Troopers and the American Cancer Society. So look for them after worship. It's the last day to submit um, let, uh, devotional ideas for our uh, Lenten community booklet, uh, if you would like to do that. And um, it's, it's the last day to uh, sign up for the District Laity School, which offers courses about lay speaking, also about um, other uh, spiritually enriching um, topics. Um, they say there's a little leeway on when you sign up, so if you don't feel ready to commit and it takes you another few days, um, feel free to still call and be a part of that. All right, let's um, begin worship with prayer. God of space and time and the here and now, we are somehow surprised that it's already February Seems like Christmas was just last week. Help us to slow down, to appreciate the gift of each moment, to see your presence in the world, in ourselves, and in each other. Starting right now, here this morning. Amen. And now, will you stand as you are able and share in our morning songs?
Amen. Please be seated, and will the children come forward now for our children's message? boys and girls. How are we all today? We're doing good. You're doing good? I'm doing good too. I'm so glad to see you all and I'm glad to be back. I've been gone for the last two Sundays so it's such a joy to see all of you here and today I have a story that I would like to tell you and the story begins as so many stories do. Once upon a time in a land far far away there lived a very wise king and queen who gave birth to a beautiful wonderful princess And they wanted this little girl of theirs to grow up and to one day find her Prince Charming. 
And so when she was born, they asked the village jeweler to craft a necklace of gold and a bracelet of gold made from the same vein of gold deep in the mountain underneath the kingdom. A what ring? Sonic ring. Sonic ring. That's not, that's not part of the story, but that sounds interesting. I'd love to hear about it later. And so the village jeweler crafted them a beautiful necklace of gold and a bracelet of gold, and then the village wizard enchanted them so that they would be forever connected one day but nobody knew when that day would arrive. They took the necklace and they gave it to the princess and she played with it as a child and wore it as a young woman. The bracelet of gold they took and cast into the depths of the deepest sea, wondering if it would ever be found again. The princess was raised knowing about this magically enchanted bracelet and necklace and she would often go to the village or to the market or to the other places around the kingdom searching for her Prince Charming. And she was told of that bracelet and she would always look to see if anyone was wearing a bracelet like the one that had been described to her. Every now and then she would see a young man wearing such a bracelet. And when she saw that, she would ask him to take off his bracelet. She would remove her necklace and she would ask to touch them together to see if fate would forge a link between them. Time and again, no link took place. Every time she saw a bracelet on a young man, she would get hopeful. Every time she would ask him to remove the bracelet, she would touch it to her necklace, and every time, no link was to be found until one day, one day the fisher folk came to town. And she noticed as the young man leapt from the boats into the water to wade his way to shore, she caught the glint of gold on his wrist. And when he came to shore, she was there waiting for him. And she introduced herself and welcomed him to her kingdom and said, I am the princess of this village. And I have a story I'd like to tell you. And she told him the story. She asked him to remove his bracelet. She removed her necklace. She touched them together. A link was forged. True love was found, and the two of them lived happily ever after. Now, boys and girls, that's a beautiful little story. I made it up. It's not true, but it still is a fun little story to listen to, isn't it? And it's fun to think about, it's fun to think about the connection, and it's fun to think about love. And today we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. That's what this stuff up, up here is about, the bread and the cup and the juice And in that act of Holy Communion, we celebrate a connection, a connection that God makes with us through Jesus. And we celebrate a love that God has for us through Jesus and that we have for God. And we remember that in the story of communion. And so I hope that you remember that God wants to connect with you and that God loves you very, very much. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the love and the power of love. And we thank you for the connection and the power of connection that we share with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, boys and girls, if you'll come and line up over here, I have some lollipops for everybody. And everybody just please take one. And once you've gotten it, go ahead and you can go down to Sunday school if it's okay with your parents. I cotton candy. Cotton candy, that's a tasty flavor. All right, everybody grab them. You can get one out of there too. Same ones. You got a mystery. Where you going? I'm going to dig around, Elliot, find the right flavor. All right, for our time of joys and concerns, look at that, half the church is empty now that the kids are gone. That's funny how that works, but uh, it's great to see children in church, isn't it? 
for our time of joys and concerns, um, I first want to share a joy with you that John and Stephanie Branch, who come to our 11 o'clock service, have been trying to have a baby for a long time now, and they finally had their baby this past week, little Saoirse Marie, and gosh, I, can, I learned how to pronounce it, I don't know how to spell it, but it's Saoirse Marie, and she is happy, and she is healthy, and uh, John and Stephanie are over the moon with uh, having this new baby, so we celebrate that with them. We often, um, just one second real quick, George, uh, we celebrate and then we mourn at the same time. And today I have some sad news to share, and that is that our organist Dan Lutz's father passed away this week as well. And so we want to be in prayer for Dan and for his family as, uh, as they process this grief and, and figure out uh, funeral arrangements and all those other things. Let's make sure that we uh, surround him with care. Uh, George. Oh, wow, okay, good. How about the guy she clocked? I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, well, we're, we're thankful that, uh, that your daughter's surgery went well and she's on the road to recovery. Any others? All right, let's go to God in prayer. If there's a praise in your heart today, if there's a joy in your life, I invite you in this moment of silence to lift up your praises before the Lord. Is there something that you're struggling with today? Is there a burden that you're carrying? Maybe one you've been carrying for a long time and you don't know how to let it go. Maybe one that you've picked up more recently. You're just starting to struggle with this and you don't wanna be carrying it for a long time, but this too, you're not sure how to let it go. Is there a prayer that you've been praying that has gone unanswered? a decision that you're facing and you don't know which way to turn, a sin or a habit that you're struggling to break, a hope or a joy that you're not quite sure how to process and figure out new things in your life. Or maybe it's a prayer not for yourself but for somebody else that you know is in need of prayer right now. I invite you in this moment of silence to lift up those prayers before the Lord. Let's have a moment of silence now to be still and to listen for God's voice. Almighty God, we come before you today with these prayers and with these praises. And Lord, we lift them up to you. And in lifting these prayers and praises up to you, we lift ourselves up to you. The joys of our lives, the problems that we face, the highs and the lows and everything in between. Lord, we bring them to you and we lay them at your feet. And we pray that you would hear us as we rejoice with the birth of a new child. 
as we mourn the passing of a dear loved one, as we celebrate the recovery of a surgery, or as we wait with anticipation for surgeries that are yet to come, or other procedures, or other uncertainties in life, other pathways, directions that unfold before us that we have not yet stepped into and we don't know what it's going to look like or who's going to be there at the end of the journey. And yet, Lord, we walk. We take our step of faith, trusting that you walk beside us and that you will never let us go. We give you thanks for this congregation. We thank you, Lord, for Cheryl and Scott being here again today and sharing the gift of music with us. We pray uh, for Cheryl in particular as she deals with the, the loss of her house. Lord, for other things that have been lifted up silently here before you, we lift them up to you as well. We rejoice in college kids coming home. We rejoice in new opportunities before us. And we pray that through it all, we would trust you more and more. All of these things we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. We're going to look at verses 14 through 23, which describes for us Jesus' interaction with his disciples at what is known as the Last Supper. And here we hear from Luke's version these words. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Now a little bit of context for this. Jesus is, this is right before he's gonna be crucified. And so he is gathering with his disciples one last time before everything is going to change. And I want you to take note of what he had said there. I have eagerly, desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then it continues. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the sacrifice that you made for us, for the love that you showed to us, and for the connection that you share with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Communion Sunday. We're gonna be looking at the power of connection and what this story in Luke reveals to us about that special power of connection. And to introduce that, I wanna show you the next slide here, which is a photograph of the new room in Bristol, England, or Bristol, as they say it over there. And that's Bishop Bickerton, who used to be our bishop, standing there behind me. That's me with the darker hair. Doesn't quite match me anymore. But you see me serving there. What you don't see, what you don't see in this room that is still called the new room, even though I don't know how old it is, 250 years old, it was, John Wesley established it when he was still alive back in the 1700s in England. And what you don't see in that picture, because there are people kneeling at the altar in the front, is a communion table that is between myself and Bishop Bickerton there. And that communion table is the same table that has sat there 
since that new room was first built. And it is the same table where I am serving communion. It's the same table that John Wesley served communion to the people of his day. Now those of you that are here today that are maybe new or that are visiting for the first time or aren't United Methodists, you know, who the heck is John Wesley? I remember some gunfighter, John Wesley Harden, but that's the closest I can come to it. Uh, John Wesley was the founder of the United Methodist Church or of the Methodist movement. He was an Anglican priest who lived in the 1700s in England and because of the movement that he started, Methodism came to America and the Methodist Church was born really started in England, although he himself never became a Methodist. He stayed as an Anglican. Even though he had problems with his church, he didn't leave his church. He stayed as an Anglican. He just wanted to start a new movement within his own church. And Methodism kind of took on a life of its own and spread until it reached us back here in 1958 at Trinity United Methodist Church. So John Wesley, that's, that's a special table because he's the founder of our denomination. But even that isn't what makes it so special as a table. What makes it a special table is that the act of communion itself doesn't just go back 200 plus years to John Wesley. It goes back 2,000 years to Jesus with these words from Luke, with the words that are shared in other gospels as well and in other parts of the New Testament where Jesus instituted this Last Supper and these words that we call Holy Communion or the Eucharist. And there's something special about that. There's something special about that, but it's so easily missed. I miss it often, and I wonder if you do too. I get so caught up in the ritual of communion and then remembering, all right, what am I supposed to do next? And Gosh, do I have everybody in the right place? And is everything going according to plan? And gosh, did the preacher preach too long? Oh wait, that's me. Did I preach too long and now we're gonna have to you know, get out late and, and the Steelers playing and so much going on in my mind that sometimes I miss out on the beauty of the moment and on experiencing what communion is all about, this power of connection. It connects me to a past with a table that one of the forefathers of the United Methodist Church served from, that I got to serve from in England, with the words that Jesus spoke years ago that I am privileged to speak over and over again, month after month in 2023. And those words and that ritual and that time somehow connects us with an ever-flowing stream of our faith that dates back all the way to Jesus. And that stream has never stopped flowing. And we continue to dip our toes into it today when we share in this act of holy communion. So what is communion all about? And how do we, how do we connect it with our past? How do you connect communion with your past? How do you connect it with your faith? How do you connect it with your life outside the walls of this church? How do you use it to connect closer with Jesus? We find in this, I'm gonna share with you four different things, and I'm gonna try to make them quick because I actually have a slightly longer communion liturgy that I wanna do today, so I am trying to do a shorter sermon. You might recognize that the depth isn't what I normally do, but I hope that the teaching still comes across. Jesus was eager. He said, eagerly I have desired to share this with you. Why was Jesus eager to share in this act of communion with them? Where was the eagerness from? I think it came from this. Jesus was eager to share this with his disciples because he knew this truth, that the power of connection provides strength in the face of suffering. Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to share this with you before I suffer. Why? Why was he eager? He wasn't eager to suffer, but he was eager to find that time of connection with his disciples in order to give him strength to go through what he knew was coming. And my goodness, I find that to be true here in church and with our church family, that we suffer together, and that isn't always easy. 
We go through the highs in life, like the birth of a baby, and we rejoice with the birth of a child, and then on the very next breath, we're sharing about a death of a dear loved one, and trying to figure out how do we process our way through all of these things. You know, over the years that I've been in ministry, I have dealt so many times looking out at faces like yours, and recognizing around those faces the story of sometimes tragedy, of the loss of loved ones, the loss of spouses, the loss of parents, the loss of children, of broken relationships through divorce or through a conflict of some sort that has people back to back instead of face to face and eye to eye. I've walked with people through job loss, through moving, through different transitions, through a lot of things that they don't teach you about in seminary. And in almost every single case, what I have to wrestle with as a pastor, and what people have to wrestle with, what you and I have to wrestle with is that so many of those situations, we can't fix them. We can't bring back the dead. We can't always heal a marriage. We can't always make better a broken relationship. We can't always get back a job. I mean, sometimes, most of the time, we can't, fix the situation and whatever you're wrestling with today we might not be able to fix that for you you might pray as hard as you can pray and you might invite others to pray with you asking that God would bend his will towards something and that God would focus his eye on something and put his hand to work to fix it and it might not get fixed at least not in the way that that you're praying about it And yet what I find with the church is that even if we can't fix it, we can help you walk through it. I've been blessed to help people walk through times of of death and times where people were so broken that they didn't know how they would make it to the next day and and yet a year down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, the sadness is still there, the grief is still there but they've they've found a little bit of spring in their step again, they've found a way forward and, and they're still in this thing called life and they've moved beyond the brokenness that they were experiencing at the time. The same is true in those relationships and in those other things. We haven't been able to fix everything, but we've been able to walk with people through the suffering. And the communion service is a reminder of that for us, that Jesus, he knew his disciples couldn't fix the situation. He knew that his disciples couldn't spare him of the agony he was about to go through. And yet he eagerly desired to spend some time with them beforehand because the power of connection provides strength in the midst of suffering. And I hope that you find that here in your church. I hope that you find that here in your peace of the family of God to know that together we might not be able to fix things but we can find strength in the midst of suffering and that we do that as we come and recognize Jesus in this act of Holy Communion. The second thing that we see here is that Jesus wasn't sure when he'd have the chance to be with his disciples again. Look at the words that he spoke. For I tell you, I will not eat eat of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Verse 18, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. There was some uncertainty there for Jesus. I mean, people will argue, maybe he knew when it was gonna happen, maybe he didn't know. Was he referring to his death and resurrection, which we think he knew about that? Was he referring to Jerusalem's fall in 70 AD? He seemed to know about that. Or was he referring to when the kingdom of God comes as it hasn't yet, even in 2023, sometime in the distant future, thousands of years later, which Jesus says he didn't know. No one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man but only the Father in heaven. So I choose to believe that Jesus was dealing with a little bit of uncertainty here. He was treasuring this time with his disciples because he didn't know when he was gonna be able to have that time again with them. But he continued on in the face of that adversity, in the face of that uncertainty, Jesus connected with his disciples and he found a special thing that all of us need to hold on to and that gift is the gift of hope the gift of hope, and it was found in this idea that 
things would be fulfilled one day. Things would be made complete one day. And in that we see this. The power of completion provides hope in the midst of uncertainty. One day this is all going to be fulfilled. One day this is all going to be made complete. Until that day there's uncertainty. Until that day we struggle, we suffer, we figure out our way through it. But somehow we trust that what God has begun, God will bring to completion. And we think of that on a large grand scale of the universe and the world and everything around it, but we also think of that in relationship to our own lives, to our own struggles. And we cling to this hope that God isn't done with us yet. That somehow God is going to continue to be faithful and to show us the way forward even in this midst of the uncertainty that we face. So where is there uncertainty in your life? What are the areas where you're struggling right now? Where do you need God's hope? Realize in this act of communion that it's a reminder to us that God isn't done with us yet, but there is power in completion, and that that completion, that power, is to give hope in the midst of uncertainty. Now, I could almost end the sermon here, and I'll tell you what a lot of preachers do, and I have in the past, because we like to stop at verse 20. We don't like to continue with verses 21 to 23. Because verse 20, it just kind of ends with the whole communion thing, and then we go right into the communion service, and you know everybody leaves happy. But I'm not going to do that today. I want to read to you verses 21 to 23. So let me start with verse 20. In the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And boy, isn't it nice just to end there and go straight into communion. But then Jesus gives this but. Verse 21. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Judas was there. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man, Judas, who betrays him. But the disciples didn't know it was Judas. And so verse 23, they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this because they couldn't seem to figure it out. Who would dare to do this to Jesus? I don't gloss over these verses today because I don't want to miss this important point, this important teaching, this principle that I think is vital to us, especially in this day and age where there's so much division in the world. There's so much political division. Are you on the right or are you on the left? Are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? Are you pro this or anti that? And gosh, we we see so much rhetoric going around and mudslinging on both sides. And even in the church, we see divisions about whether the United Methodist Church should do this or that, and what direction should we go, and uh, you know, calling for votes to disaffiliate or stay together, and all these different things. And my goodness, do we miss the point that Judas was at the table with Jesus? I mean, you talk about division. You talk about someone who would certainly not want to have fellowship with someone else. Can't you see Jesus drawing a line in the sand and saying, all right, Judas, I'll tell you what. If you're going to betray me to be put to death and tortured, I'm not going to share a meal with you. I'm certainly going to say, this is the point at which we part ways. But Jesus didn't do that. He addressed it. And then he served communion to Judas. John's gospel in chapter 13 tells us that Jesus knelt before Judas and washed his feet, knowing that Judas was on a very different side of things than Jesus. The power of Jesus' love for Judas was greater than the power of Judas' betrayal of Jesus. And I want to focus on those verses because I want to make this point that Jesus is talking about a new covenant. A new covenant, not like the old covenant of law, Not like the old covenant of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And unless you do what I say, I'm going to punish you forever. But this new covenant that says it's a covenant of love. It's a covenant of grace. It's a covenant encapsulated with the words, love each other as I have loved you. 
And it says they will know we are Christians. How? By our love. Here's a few things that Jesus says that point us to this next point. Go ahead and put it up there on the screen. The power of covenant provides acceptance in the midst of division. Jesus knew he was in a covenant of love, even with Judas. And even though things might change from this day forward, right now, Jesus wasn't going to be the one to make that change. He was going to let Judas make his decisions. And he was going to love Judas through that process and share communion with him. The power of covenant provides acceptance in the midst of division. And I would guess that there's some division in your life. You wrestle with the politics and maybe people in your own family who disagree with you. There might be division in your understanding of the church. Might be division in your understanding of the way people should interact at work or what the government should do and how involved they should be or any of these different things. And yet in the power of covenant is there hope that despite our differences, despite our disagreements, we can still love each other enough to sit at the table together and to find acceptance. Doesn't mean affirmation or approval, but acceptance in the midst of division. I think Jesus modeled that. And I believe he modeled that through this new covenant that he speaks about here. I wanna share a few verses with you of that new covenant. And then boy, I gotta wrap it up because I'm not going short, am I? John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Paul says this in Romans 13, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves his fellow man or fellow woman has fulfilled the law. Whatever other commandment there may be, they are all summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said it, Paul said it, Paul reiterates it in Colossians 3.14, he speaks about a bunch of different virtues and good things, and then he says, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So when you think of communion, I want you also to think of connection. I want you also to think of completion. And I want you to think about covenant, that we are a part of a covenant of love that Jesus has instituted the communion. And it's a covenant that breaks down barriers. It's a covenant that breaks down walls. And it's a covenant that stubbornly refuses to do what everybody else seems to be doing, to put up walls of hatred, to put up walls of division. And instead, it it takes the way of sacrifice and reminds us of the power of a covenantal love that is so great that it would lead Jesus to a cross where he would sacrifice himself for you and me in order to show that there is no length to which God would not go to show his love for us. Over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love does that for all of these things. And so finally the last thing to share about communion is this idea of the power of love. The power of love, ultimately it connects us to Christ and to each other. You know that trick that I did for my children's message today isn't really a magic trick. I mean, it's kind of neat there how they interlink at the end, but this is more of a puzzle. I've seen these sold at travel centers and truck stops more than I've seen them sold at magic shops. And yet I use it today and I use it even in my magic show that I perform with a story along with it. That story is kind of a nice story for kids. But that's not the story that I like to tell with. The story that I end that trick with and sometimes end my whole show with is this story. After I talk about, you know, love was found, uh, a link was forged, true love was found, and the two lived happily ever after. I then share with the audience what I just shared with you. This isn't really a magic trick. But what makes it work and what makes it worthy is the power of the principle that it illustrates. And that principle is the power of connection. The power of connection. 
And that's something that all of us feel. That's something that all of us desire. That's something that all of us yearn for, is that connection. And we came so close to losing that with COVID a few years back when we weren't able to meet together in church or anywhere else. And we had to quarantine and close ourselves off from everybody and six feet apart. And we all, so many people felt that we lost a connection that was so vital to us. And so we, we looked for other ways to connect on Zoom or on Microsoft Teams or through meeting together. My mother and I, for my birthday, we drove to a, trow- or to a shopping center that was closed down because everything was closed. And she brought a donut and coffee and I brought a donut and coffee and we brought a chair and we sat underneath an overhang at a store that wasn't open, about eight, eight to 10 feet apart from each other and had a donut and a coffee together to celebrate my birthday because we wanted to connect with each other and we missed each other because the power of connection brings us together and communion is that power of connection for us and Jesus desires that eagerly desires that with each and every one of us. And so today I invite you to experience that power of connection, to pray and to give yourself over to Jesus and to align your life with his and to say yes to the connection that he wants to make with you and to start following step by step, day by day and living into this relationship with Jesus that shows us the power of love, that connects us with Christ and with each other. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the power of connection, and we pray that as we experience that power, that we would also do all that we can to not fight against each other, but to fight for each other, and to love each other as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For a time of Holy Communion today, I begin by sharing that we have an open table here, which means that whether you're a member of this church or not, or a member of any church or not, if you're here today and you're searching for a closer relationship with God through Jesus, then this table is open. We invite you to come and share in Holy Communion with us. The second thing I'd like to say about it is that the service that we're going to, the the liturgy that we're going to use today is a liturgy that I first experienced when I was at that new room of John Wesley's in England several years ago. It was a liturgy that I had never heard before. You may have heard it before, because I think we've done it here before, uh, maybe one other time. Uh, But for many of you, it might be brand new. I I love the the flow of the words. It's almost poetic in its language. And I invite you to share in this liturgy with me today. But let's begin as we always do, with a time of silent confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. Now Carol, I'm gonna ask you to stay with me in this booth because I had this all printed out and I don't remember where I put it. So I'm gonna have to follow along with the words on the screen just like the rest of you. But the full liturgy is here and I would invite you to respond with the capital words in bold face. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Gather us in, the lost and the lonely, the broken and breaking, the tired and the aching, who long for the nourishment found at your feast. This, the done and the doubting, the wishing and wondering, the puzzled and pondering, who long for the company found at your feast. The proud and pretentious, the sure and superior, the never inferior, who long for the leveling found at your feast. The bright and the bustling, the stirrers and shakers, the kind laughter makers, who long for the deeper joys found at your feast. From corner or limelight, from mansion or campsite, 
from fears and obsession, from tears and depression, from untold excesses, from treasured successes, to meet, to eat, to be given a seat, be joined to the vine, be given new wine, become like the least, be found at the feast. Lord God, early in the morning when the world was young, you made life in all its beauty and terror. You gave birth to all that we know. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, when the world least expected it, a newborn child crying in a cradle announced that you had come among us, that you were one of us. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, surrounded by respectable liars, religious leaders, anxious statesmen, and silent friends, you accepted the penalty for doing good, for being God. You shouldered and suffered the cross. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, a voice in a guarded graveyard and footsteps in the dew proved that you had risen, that you came back to those and for those who had forgotten, denied, and destroyed you. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, in the multicolored company of your church on earth and in heaven, we celebrate your creation, your life, your death and resurrection, your interest in us. So to you we pray. Lord, bring new life where we are worn and tired, new love where we have turned hard-hearted, forgiveness where we feel hurt and where we have wounded, and the joy of your Holy Spirit where we are prisoners of ourselves. Let us say a prayer for those who need to be remembered today, those who have made the news headlines today because of what they have done or said. Those who have been brought to our attention through a meeting or conversation, Those who are in the hospital, in a rest home, or in a place which is strange to them. Those in whose family, marriage, or close relationship there is stress or a breakup. Those who need to forget the God they do not believe in and meet the God who believes in them. those whose pain or potential we should not forget to share with God today. Pray with me. Lord, we believe that you hear our prayer and will be faithful to your promise to answer us. When our eyes open again, may they do so not to end our devotions, but to expect your kingdom. For Jesus' sake, amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward. On the night that he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And then in the same way he took the cup, gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this to remember me. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember you today and we ask that you would pour out your spirit today upon these gifts of bread and juice and upon all of us who are gathered here. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. Together make us one with each other, one with Christ, and one with all creation as we celebrate the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Lord, help us today to make this connection with you as you seek to connect with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I also have gluten-free wafers here. For anyone that would like to have a gluten-free wafer, you can come up uh, to see me over here. And I don't think I have the disposables today. So if you're not comfortable taking communion, you can come up and just have your arms crossed and you'll just receive a blessing from us. But the table is ready and we invite you to come.
If there are any in the congregation who would like to receive communion, uh, but you don't want to have to come forward for it, please uh, indicate a uh, raise of the hand and the ushers will bring it to you. The Bible says as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. For our ministry moment, I'll make it brief. Um, but I just want to highlight for you that today, following the 11 o'clock service, we're having a welcome luncheon for people that are new to the church and are interested in learning more about what it means to be a member of the church. And I'm excited to say that we had 29 people sign up, 22 adults and seven children. And we're very excited about that. And if some of you are on that list, although I think most of them are coming in the 11 o'clock service for, since they're staying afterwards, uh, we certainly are glad that you're a part of us. Anybody out here that didn't sign up, but you're new and you wanna just come and check it out and see what it's all about, uh, there's no obligation to sign up for anything. Uh, we'll certainly give you the opportunity to ask questions and see if you're interested in taking the next step toward membership, but it's a free lunch and it's at 12.15 today and anybody that's interested, uh, please plan to come, even if you're not, even if you already haven't let us know, we've, we've made room for more. And I share that as our ministry moment just to say, you know what, we are a church that is growing. We are a church that is reaching new people and the participation that all of you have in that whether it's giving money to help us buy food to serve a luncheon, or whether it's just being here with your, yourself in the seat so that when people and visitors come, they don't see an empty church because you're here. Uh, if it's greeting them and giving them a smile and a handshake and saying, welcome to Trinity, whatever way you contribute, uh, you are building God's kingdom. And by being here at church, you're helping to show others that church matters, that faith matters that Jesus matters, and we're glad that you're here. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks that you are at work here at Trinity Church, and we pray that you would work in and through us to draw more and more people to learn about Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like us to stand together as we close with There Is No One Like Jesus. Or is this an anthem? And never mind. We're going to just listen as we're blessed with the music of the choir. There is no one like Jesus. Would the choir please come forward?
Amen. Thank you for sharing that gift of music with us. And now may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.